the formula is not important to memorize. OK, I'm now going to do this in balance sheets, OK, so that we can connect it to the money view. So what am I saying here? Let's think about these, a, a world in which there are just two people, these two people here. Okay. Each of them has $100 worth of wealth. We have the risk tolerant person. Okay. And what are they doing? Okay. They, they have a, let's say both of them have $100, $100 worth of wealth. Um, the risk tolerant person, I said, puts more than all of their wealth in the market portfolio and they borrow in order to do that. Okay, so let's say they have 150 in the market, the risky portfolio, and they have 50 in a loan. Okay, so their net worth is 100. Right? And then this risk averse person. Okay also has, by assumption, net worth of 100, okay, but they don't, they have a different portfolio here, okay, they're spreading their wealth between the risk-free and the market portfolio, so they have here uh, 50 in the market portfolio and 50 in the risk-free, and they also have net worth equals 100, okay? Now, now I'm going to show you a piece of CAPM that Fisher believed, okay, that is not so standard in teaching CAPM. He said, this 50 is this 50, okay? This is inside borrowing between private people. It's not treasury bills. There's a bank. Okay, that is making a loan and taking deposits. Okay. This was Fisher Black's way of getting money into the finance story. Okay. He wrote a very famous paper called uh, Banking in a World Without Money, okay, in which he puts forward, actually in words, not in balance sheets, but this, this, sort, of, this sort of picture. It was his very first publication. And this was his image of the world. It's a CAPM image of the world in the sense that the, the main thing that's going on is people are allocating their wealth. They're allocating their wealth between risky security and a risk-free security. That's the main thing that's going on. Okay? And what this bank is doing okay, is, is acting as an intermediary okay, in between the risk-averse and the risk-tolerant I have only two people here, but you can imagine in a big economy, what's going on is these loans, you know, maybe they're not really risk-free because these are private agents, not the government, but if you had a portfolio of them and you could figure this out, you know, you could actuarially figure this thing out um, and you could, you could make sure you, you don't lend them more than their wealth or something like that, um, maybe you could make them sort of risk-free. Um, and then these deposits are, are here. It. Is he's thinking about what happens in this world when the price of assets changes, okay, which is a natural question for somebody coming from finance, right? The price can change for any reason at all, right? It doesn't require accumulation, just a change in expectations, right? This is the point. The future determines the present. These prices are not nailed down firmly, okay? They're fluctuating. You know, volatility is the nature of the world. So ask yourself, what happens What happens if the price of capital goes up? Okay. What happens if the price of capital goes up is that the risk tolerant person makes money. Okay. The risk averse person makes money. They both have the market portfolio, so they both make money. The risk tolerant person makes three times as much money. Okay. And now their portfolio is not balanced anymore. You know, if they wanted a ratio of three to one here, their portfolio is not balanced anymore. Okay. What they want to do, in fact, is now borrow more. Okay. They want to borrow more. Okay. So if PK goes up, you want to borrow more, borrow more. 
to buy more of the market portfolio. And the opposite is here, okay? If PK goes up, okay, you now are going to have more risk than you really want to be having, more of your portfolio in the risky, risky thing. And so you want to sell some of that off and buy some more, more uh, risk-free, so you want to lend more and sell risky assets. Here, borrow more and buy risky assets. Okay? And what that means for banking, right, is an increase on both sides of these balance sheets. You know, borrowing more, lending more, an increase on both sides of these balance sheets for this intermediary. Okay, let, let me just slow down and tell you what this argument is here. This is saying that in order for capital markets to clear, in order for, their, for people to be able to allocate their wealth between risky and, and risk-free securities freely in an efficient market, okay, it has to be so that the money supply is endogenous. The money supply is endogenous. When prices go up, the money supply goes up. I just showed you. Right? The money supply is the liabilities of the banking system. So when the prices go up, the money supply goes up. It has to be so. If it didn't, there would be an imbalance in the capital market here. So, um, and, uh, and so equilibrium in asset markets requires that the money supply is passive. Okay? That's the story he's telling. Okay? That's that 1976, what a non-monetarist thinks. It's this model that he has in his mind. Okay, that is leading him to say these really extravagant and strong things that made him uh, a bete noir of the monetarists. Um, and of the economists as well. Okay, he didn't mind being a minority of one. I think he kind of liked it, his personality. Okay, so you see those two points. So he said, if you're going to look at the quantity theory of money, okay, you should read it from right to left. Okay? It's the transactions that determine the quantity of money, not the other way around. Okay? 